Margaret Atwood, the author of the book Handmaid's Tale, on which the show was based, keeps saying that nothing I've written hasn't already happened, and nothing that we build doesn't already exist. Almost everything described in the book and the show Handmaid's Tale has a parallel in a totalitarian or religious state, military regime, religious order or cult, or chillingly, in Western society today. Hi, I'm Molly, and today I'm going to be figuring out which historical events inspired the author and the show's screenwriters, and why The Handmaid's Tale can serve as a warning to the whole world. Forced Pregnancy The fictional theocratic dictatorship of Gilead is not so different from what was happening in modern Cambodia during the reign of Pol Pot in the late 70s. The Khmer Rouge, like the commanders of Gilead, explicitly wanted more births. Their aim was to increase the country's population from 8 million people to 20 million. In order to reach their goal, the government carried out a largely hidden campaign of mass forced marriages and forced pregnancies. Mass weddings occurred, during which hundreds of random men and women were split into couples and announced husbands and wives. If anyone refused, they were threatened with an execution. The main responsibility of such a family was to reproduce and have as many children as they could. They were told to produce a child for Angkar, the Khmer Rouge's all-seeing organization. Khmer Rouge cadres stood outside huts at night, listening to make sure the newly minted couples had intimate relationships. The world only discovered this ugly truth a few years ago when the victims of this immoral campaign found the strength to tell the facts at an international tribunal. Children's Kidnapping in the show, the child of the main character, June, is taken away from her and given to the commander for adoption. It sounds insane now, but history knows plenty of cases when the government deliberately took children away from their parents. For instance, during World War II, the Nazi regime kidnapped thousands of children regarded as Aryan-looking to raise them as children of the Third Reich. All the blonde-haired and blue-eyed children were moved from the territory of the conquered countries to Germany to be Germanized. An estimated 400 100,000 children were abducted throughout Europe. The country that suffered most was Poland. About 200,000 children were forced to separate from their families. The Nazi propagated the idea that these children were actually descendant of German blood. Thus, the Nazis convinced themselves they were not actually stealing kids, but were mostly reclaiming lost blood that belonged to the fatherland. Similar actions took place around the same time in Spain, where the dictatorship of Francisco Franco took children from the supporters of the Spanish Republic. They were passed to state orphanages, monastery shelters, or trustworthy families faithful to the dictatorship. If you think that such atrocities make sense due to the military regimes of the time, then here's some more modern data. In 1958, the Child Welfare League of America began what they called the Indian Adoption Project. They believed that children living in First Nation reservations were not living up to American standards, so children were very literally kidnapped from their homes, even if there was no evidence of parental mistreat. None of them were ever documented in order to keep records of their birth parents, and they were given to white families for adoption. Death Penalty for centuries, people in different countries would gather at central squares of their cities to have what little fun they could out of the death penalty. With such a harsh punishment, the governments tried to scare people out of committing the same actions in the future. That's why the bodies of the convicts were left hanging there for a few weeks for everyone to see. The residents of Gilead also got used to the wall, where people are hung in a very public place. Now, while the death penalty is banned in 106 countries in the world, such shots seem wild and made up by the screenwriters. But it is still a reality for the residents of some countries. Punishments like being hung or stoned to death are still used in such countries as North Korea, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Somali, and other states. It evoked an emotional outcry from the world when back in 2008, in an area of Somalia controlled by fundamentalist Al-Shabaab militants, a 13-year-old girl was accused of adultery and stoned to death by 50 adult men as the crowd watched. According to a survey conducted in 2004, two-thirds of Americans were in favor of televising executions. Now, how far have we really come since the Middle Ages? Clothes as a way of humiliation. 
Much like in The Handmaid's Tale, state intervention in the way women dress also indicated a wider pattern of oppression. The servants wear bright red modest clothes and cover their heads with the white wing that definitely limits their vision. The wives have more exquisite clothing items of different shades of blue, and the darker the shade, the higher the position her husband has. The ants wear brown clothes that resemble Nazi uniforms. Despite the fact that such color-based segregation was a figment of the author's imagination, there are many examples of clothing being used to show a woman where she belongs. One bright example is the consequences of the Islamic Revolution that took place in Iran about 40 years ago when Islamic fundamentalists replaced the pro-European monarchy. Back in the beginning of the 70s, women in Iran were wearing heels and short skirts, worked just like men did, and in no way differed from women in Europe or in the US. But with the establishment of the Islamic Republic back in 1979, their lives changed completely. In particular, the law about the protection of the family that protected women from their husband's mistreatment and authority was canceled, as it was declared contradictory to Islamic values. Farah Kru Parsa, the first female minister of Iran, was executed during the revolution. The new law also obliged women to cover their bodies and heads according to Islamic tradition. According to the law, a girl should stay covered after she turns nine, but in fact, that's demanded from six-year-old students in the first grade, given that they have separate education from boys. The clothes should be dark, ideally black. Fair or bright colors were considered depraved for women. The new government also passed laws that allowed polygamy for men and stoning women to death for breaking the order and cheating on their husbands. As we see, events in which a democratic country becomes a closed totalitarian state over a very short period of time aren't simply made up by some writers. They're a historical reality. Homosexuality is illegal. In The Handmaid's Tale, Homosexuality makes someone a gender traitor. Gay men were killed and hung on the wall. Lesbians were cruelly circumcised and put into colonies. But it's only been a short while since homosexuality has ceased to be considered unnatural and illegal in developed countries. And still, in many countries and regions, homosexuality is considered a sickness that requires prevention and treatment. In 12 countries, homosexuals are either imprisoned for life or executed. Dozens of countries still enact criminal prosecution for homosexuals. The first country where homosexuals got some legal rights about 40 years ago was the Netherlands. But only 10 years after that, in 1989, the first law about registered same-sex relationships was passed. The first same-sex couple that registered their relationship was Danish gay activists Aisel and Igel Axgill. The town Berkeley in California, USA, was the first one in the world to pass the law on domestic partnerships for same-sex families in 1984, but it took a whole 30 years for the U.S. Supreme Court to legalize the registration of same-sex marriages around the whole country. Environmental Destruction Gilead has such an awful ecology that the convicts in the colonies have to clean up radioactive waste. Since there is no protection, being sent to a colony pretty much equals to a slow and painful death. This pollution is also the cause of the infertility epidemic in the state, affecting both men and women. This Margaret Atwood book can really be seen as prophetic. She wrote it in 1985, a year before the catastrophe in Chernobyl in 1986, where just like in Gilead, colonies of people cleaned up the territory polluted with radiation. Despite the fact that they use protection costumes and gas masks, for many of them, the dose of radiation they got was deathly or even resulted in future cancer diagnoses. You can find out more about the catastrophe in Chernobyl in our exclusive video series. Female Circumcision in the first season of A Handmaid's Tale, Emily became the victim of female genital mutilation as a punishment for having an intimate relationship with another woman. Unfortunately, this cruel and unjustified procedure is still carried out in 30 countries, mainly in Africa and in the Middle East. In some countries, it is a ritual act done to oppress women in every generation. In other places, it is used as punishment. Back in 2016, UNICEF estimated that 200 million women went through the procedure. 
In societies where they practice the circumcision, there is an opinion that it decreases the desire for sex and prevents the woman from having casual sex before marriage and saves a woman's virginity. Typically carried out by a traditional circumciser using a blade, FGM is conducted anywhere from just a few days after birth to puberty and beyond. In half the countries for which national figures are available, most girls are cut before they turn five. In many cases, mothers and grandmothers are doing this to their own daughters, even though they know how painful the procedure actually is. Such harmful procedures are considered the violation of girls' and women's rights on an international level. As international organizations estimated, these practices stem from gender discrimination tradition and are the extreme form of it. On the 28th of November 2012, the UN signed a resolution that prohibits female circumcision. In addition to its prevalence in immigrant communities in the US, FGM was considered a standard medical procedure in America for the most part of the last two centuries. Centuries. Physicians performed operations of varying invasiveness to cure a number of diagnoses such as hysteria, depression, nymphomania, and frigidity. With the passage of the federal law ban, the Female Genital Mutilation Act in 1996, performing FGM on anyone under age 18 became a felony in America. Abortion Restrictions after some U.S. states passed restrictive abortion laws, the country was engulfed in massive acts of protests, at which women would wear blood-red robes, a nod to Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, in which childbearing is entirely controlled by the state. But one doesn't need to turn to fiction for dubious examples of where these kinds of laws can lead. For decades, communist Romania was a real-life test case of what can happen when a state bans abortion completely, and the results were just devastating. Back in 1966, the dictator Nicolae Sosicu passed a law that prohibited abortions and all contraceptives. There was even a special department in the government, the agents of which would go around women's workplaces and have them take pregnancy tests. If after a few visits, the test turned out negative, a woman had to pay a high tax on abstinence. Such measures led to the birth level rising from 1.9 to 3.7. For many women, sexuality represented a fear and not a part of life that can be enjoyed, said Irene Ilse, co-founder of the Front Association, a Romanian feminist group. While richer women could find themselves an underground doctor to carry out an abortion or sneak some contraceptives into the country, the poor members of society couldn't do the same. As an extreme measure, many Romanian women turned to home abortion. By 1989, about 10,000 women died as a result of dangerous practices. Also, the number of children given up and left in orphanages increased rapidly, as their parents just weren't capable of feeding them. In a country with a population of more than 20 million, more than 170,000 children were growing up in orphanages. It's worth noting that in some sense, this law was milder than the similar one passed in Alabama the same year. In Romania, women were allowed to terminate pregnancy in case of sexual assault or if the fetus had a dangerous pathological condition. The Romanian experience is a warning for what happens when the state tries to control its citizens' reproductive rights. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our new channel, Awesome Movies, to watch some analyses of your favorite movies and TV shows.